Section twenty of the Elements of Botany. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Yearsley. The Elements of Botany by Asa Gray. Section twenty. Cryptogamous or flowerless plants. Even the beginner in botany should have some general idea of what cryptogamous plants are and what are the obvious distinctions of the principal families although the lower grades are difficult and need special books and good microscopes for their study the higher orders such as ferns may be determined almost as readily as phanerogamous plants linnaeus gave to this lower grade of plants the name of cryptogamia thereby indicating that their organs answering to stamens and pistils if they had any were recondite and unknown there is no valid reason why this long familiar name should not be kept up along with the counterpart one of phanerogamia although organs analogous to stamens and pistil or rather to pollen and ovule have been discovered in all the higher and most of the lower grades of this series of plants so also the english synonymous name of flowerless plants is both good and convenient for they have not flowers in the proper sense the essentials of flowers are stamens and pistils giving rise to seeds and the essential of a seed is an embryo cryptogamous or flowerless plants are propagated by spores and a spore is not an embryo plantlet but mostly a single plant cell vascular cryptogams which compose the higher orders of this series of plants have stems and usually leaves constructed upon the general plan of ordinary plants that is they have wood wood cells and vessels in the stem and leaves in the latter as a framework of veins but the lower grades having only the more elementary cellular structure are called cellular cryptogams far the larger number of the former are ferns wherefore that class has been called pteridophyta pteridophytes in english form meaning fern plants that is ferns and their relatives they are mainly horsetails ferns club mosses and various aquatics which have been called hydropterides i e water ferns horsetails equisitaceae is the name of a family which consists only among now living plants of equisetum the botanical name of horsetail and scouring rush they have hollow stems with partitions at the nodes the leaves consist only of a whirl of scales at each node these coalescent into a sheath from the axils of these leaf scales in many species branches grow out which are similar to the stem but on a much smaller scale close jointed and with the tips of the leaves more apparent at the apex of the stem appears the fructification as it is called for lack of a better term in the form of a short spike or head this consists of a good number of stalked shields bearing on their inner or under face several wedge-shaped spore cases the spore cases when they ripen open down the inner side and discharge a great number of green spores of a size large enough to be well seen by a hand glass the spores are aided in their discharge and dissemination by four club-shaped threads attached to one part of them these are hygrometric when moist they are rolled up over the spore when dry they straighten and exhibit lively movements closing over the spore when breathed upon and unrolling promptly a moment after as they dry see figures four hundred and ninety three to four hundred and ninety eight illustration figure four nine three upper part of a stem of a horsetail equisetum sylvaticum four nine four part of the head or spike of spore cases with some of the latter taken off four nine five view more enlarged of underside of the shield shaped body bearing a circle of spore cases four nine six one of the latter detached and more magnified four nine seven a spore with the attached arms moistened four nine eight same when dry the arms extended illustration figure four nine nine a tree fern dixonia arborescens with a young one near its base in front a common herbaceous fern polypodium vulgare with its creeping stem or rootstock illustration figure five hundred a section of the trunk of a tree fern ferns or filices a most attractive family of plants are very numerous and varied 
in warm and equable climates some rise into forest trees with habit of palms but most of them are perennial herbs the wood of a fern trunk is very different however from that of a palm or of any exogenous stem either a section is represented in figure five hundred the curved plates of wood each terminate upward in a leaf stalk the subterranean trunk or stem of any strong growing herbaceous fern shows a similar structure most ferns are circinate in the bud that is are rolled up in the manner shown in figure one nine seven uncoiling as they grow they have some likeness to a crozier illustration figure five o one the walking fern camptosaurus reduced in size showing its fruit dots on the veins approximated in pairs five o two a small piece pinule of a shield fern a row of fruit dots on each side of the midrib each covered by its kidney-shaped inducium five o three a spore case from the latter just bursting by the partial straightening of the incomplete ring well magnified five o four three of the spores of five o nine more magnified five o five schizia pusilla a very small and simple leaved fern drawn nearly of natural size five o six one of the lobes of its fruit-bearing portion magnified bearing two rows of spore cases five o seven spore case of the latter detached opening lengthwise five o eight adder tongue ophioglossum spore cases in a kind of spike a a portion of the fruiting part about natural size showing two rows of the firm spore cases which open transversely into two valves the fructification of ferns is borne on the back or under side of the leaves the early botanists thought this such a peculiarity that they always called a fern leaf a frond and its petiole a stipe usage continues these terms although they are superfluous the fruit of ferns consists of spore cases technically sporangia which grow out of the veins of the leaf sometimes these are distributed over the whole lower surface of the leaf or frond or over the whole surface when there are no proper leaf blades to the frond but all is reduced to stalks commonly the spore cases occupy only detached spots or lines each of which is called a saurus or in english merely a fruit dot in many ferns these fruit dots are naked in others they are produced under a scale-like bit of membrane called an inducium in maidenhair ferns a little lobe of the leaf is folded back over each fruit dot to serve as its shield or inducium in the true brake or bracken teris the whole edge of the fruit-bearing part of the leaf is folded back over it like a hem the form and structure of the spore cases can be made out with a common hand magnifying glass the commonest kind shown in figure 503 has a stalk formed of a row of jointed cells and is itself composed of a layer of thin walled cells but is incompletely surrounded by a border of thicker walled cells forming the ring this extends from the stalk up one side of the spore case round its summit descends on the other side but there gradually vanishes in ripening and drying the shrinking of the cells of the ring on the outer side causes it to straighten in doing so it tears the spore case open on the weaker side and discharges the minute spores that fill it commonly with a jerk which scatters them to the wind another kind of spore case figure 507 is stalkless and has its ring cells forming a kind of cap at the top at maturity it splits from top to bottom by a regular dehiscence a third kind is of firm texture and opens across into two valves like a clam shell figure 508 a this kind makes an approach to the next family illustration figure 509 a young prothallus of a maidenhair moderately enlarged and an older one with the first fern leaf developed from near the notch 510 middle portion of the young one much magnified showing below partly among the rootlets the antheridia or fertilizing organs and above near the notch three pistillidia to be fertilized the spores germinate on moistened ground in a conservatory they may be found germinating on a damp wall or on the edges of a well-watered flower pot instead of directly forming a fern plantlet the spore grows first into a body which closely resembles a small liverwort this is named a prothallus 
figure 509 from some point of this a bud appears to originate which produces the first fern leaf soon followed by a second and third and so the stem and leaves of the plant are set up illustration figure 511 lycopodium carolinianum of nearly natural size 512 inside view of one of the bracts and spore case magnified illustration figure 513 open four valved spore case of a selaginella and its four large spores macrospores magnified 514 macrospores of another selaginella 515 same separated illustration figure 516 plant of isoetes 517 base of a leaf and contained sporocarp filled with microspores cut across magnified 518 same divided lengthwise equally magnified some microspores seen at the left 519 section of a spore case containing macrospores equally magnified at the right three macrospores more magnified investigation of this prothallus under the microscope resulted in the discovery of a wholly unsuspected kind of fertilization taking place at this germinating stage of the plant on the underside of the prothallus two kinds of organs appear figure 510 one may be likened to an open and depressed ovule with a single cell at bottom answering to nucleus the other to an anther but instead of pollen it discharges corkscrew shaped microscopic filaments which bear some cilia of extreme tenuity by the rapid vibration of which the filaments move freely over a wet surface these filaments travel over the surface of the prothallus and even to other prothalli for there are natural hybrid ferns reach and enter the ovule like cavities and fertilize the cell this thereupon sets up a growth forms a vegetable bud and so develops the new plant an essentially similar process of fertilization has been discovered in the preceding and the following families of pteridophytes but it is mostly subterranean and very difficult to observe club mosses or lycopodiums some of the common kinds called ground pine are familiar being largely used for christmas wreaths and other decoration they are low evergreens some creeping all with considerable wood in their stems this thickly beset with small leaves in the axils of some of these leaves or more commonly in the axils of peculiar leaves changed into bracts as in figures 511 512 spore cases appear as roundish or kidney-shaped bodies of firm texture opening round the top into two valves and discharging a great quantity of a very fine yellow powder the spores the selaginellas have been separated from lycopodium which they much resemble because they produce two kinds of spores in separate spore cases one kind microspores is just that of lycopodium the other consists of only four large spores macrospores in a spore case which usually breaks in pieces at maturity figures 513 to 515 the quillworts isoetes figures 516 to 519 are very unlike club mosses in aspect but have been associated with them they look more like rushes and live in water or partly out of it a very short stem like a corm bears a cluster of roots underneath above it is covered by the broad bases of a cluster of awl shaped or thread shaped leaves the spore cases are immersed in the bases of the leaves the outer leaf bases contain numerous macrospores the inner are filled with innumerable microspores illustration figure 520 plant of marsilia quadrifoliata reduced in size at the right a pair of sporocarps of about natural size the pillworts marsilia and pillularia are low aquatics which bear globular or pill-shaped fruit sporocarps on the lower part of their leaf stalks or on their slender creeping stems the leaves of the commoner species of marsilia might be taken for four-leafed clover see figure 520 the sporocarps are usually raised on a short stalk within they are divided lengthwise by a partition and then crosswise by several partitions these partitions bear numerous delicate sacs or spore cases of two kinds intermixed the larger ones contain each a large spore or macrospore 
the smaller contain numerous microspores immersed in mucilage at maturity the fruit bursts or splits open at top and the two kinds of spores are discharged the large ones in germination produce a small prothallus upon which the contents of the microspores act in the same way as in ferns and with a similar result azolla is a little floating plant looking like a small liverwort or moss its branches are covered with minute and scale-shaped leaves on the under side of the branches are found egg-shaped thin-walled sporocarps of two kinds the small ones open across and discharge microspores the larger burst irregularly and bring to view globose spore cases attached to the bottom of the sporocarp by a slender stalk these delicate spore cases burst and set free about four macrospores which are fertilized at germination in the manner of the pillworts and quillworts see figures five two one to five two six illustration figure five two one small plant of azola caroliniana five two two portion magnified showing the two kinds of sporocarp the small ones contain microspores five two three represents one more magnified five two four the larger sporocarp more magnified five two five same more magnified and burst open showing stalked spore cases five two six two of the latter highly magnified one of them bursting shows four contained macrospores between the two three of these spores highly magnified cellular cryptogams are so called because composed even in their higher forms of cellular tissue only without proper wood cells or vessels many of the lower kinds are mere plates or ribbons or simple rows of cells or even single cells but their highest orders follow the plan of ferns and phanerogamous plants in having stem and leaves for their upward growth and commonly roots or at least rootlets to attach them to the soil or to trunks or to other bodies on which they grow plants of this grade are chiefly mosses so as a whole they take the name of bryophyta bryophytes in english form bryum being the greek name of a moss these plants are of two principal kinds true mosses musci which is their latin name in the plural and hepatic mosses or liverworts hepatici illustration figure five two seven single plant of physcomitrium piriformi magnified five two eight top of a leaf cut across it consists of a single layer of cells mosses or musci the pale peat mosses species of sphagnum the principal component of sphagnus bogs and the strong-growing hair-cap moss polytrichum are among the larger and commoner representatives of this numerous family while fountain moss fontinalis in running water sometimes attains the length of a yard or more on the other hand some are barely individually distinguishable to the naked eye figure five two seven represents a common little moss enlarged to about twelve times its natural size and by its side is part of a leaf much magnified showing that it is composed of cellular tissue parenchyma cells only the leaves of mosses are always simple distinct and sessile on the stem the fructification is an urn-shaped spore case in this case as in most cases raised on a slender stalk the spore case loosely bears on its summit a thin and pointed cap like a candle extinguisher called a calyptra detaching this it is found that the spore case is like a pyxis that is the top at maturity comes off as a lid operculum and that the interior is filled with a green powder the spores which are discharged through the open mouth in most mosses there is a fringe of one or two rows of teeth or membrane around this mouth or orifice the peristome when moist the peristome closes hygrometrically over the orifice more or less when drier the teeth or processes commonly bend outwards or recurve and then the spores more readily escape in hair-cap moss a membrane is stretched quite across the mouth like a drumhead retaining the spores until this wears away see figures five two seven to five four one for details fertilization in mosses is by the analogues of stamens and pistils which are hidden in the axils of leaves or in the cluster of leaves at the end of the stem the analogue of the anther antheridium 
is a cellular sac which in bursting discharges innumerable delicate cells floating in a mucilaginous liquid each of these bursts and sets free a vibratile self-moving thread these threads one or more reach the orifice of the pistol-shaped body the pistillidium and act upon a particular cell at its base within this cell in its growth develops into the spore case and its stalk when there is any carrying on its summit the wall of the pistillidium which becomes the calyptra illustration figure 529 neum cuspidatum smaller than nature 530 its calyptra detached enlarged 531 its spore case with top of stalk magnified the lid 532 being detached the outer peristome appears 533 part of a cellular ring annulus which was under the lid outside of the peristome more magnified 534 some of the outer and of the inner peristome consisting of jointed teeth much magnified 535 antheridia and a pistillidium the so-called flower at end of a stem of same plant the leaves torn away male antheridia female pistillidium magnified 536 a bursting antheridium and some of the accompanying jointed threads highly magnified 537 summit of an open spore case of a moss which has a peristome of sixteen pairs of teeth 538 the double peristome of a hypnum 539 to 541 spore case detached calyptra and top of more enlarged spore case and detached lid of physcometrium piriforme figure 527 orifice shows that there is no peristome liverworts or hepatic mosses hepatici in some kinds resemble true mosses having distinct stem and leaves although their leaves occasionally run together while in others there is no distinction of stem and leaf but the whole plant is a leaf-like body which produces rootlets on the lower face and its fructification on the upper those of the moss-like kind sometimes called scale mosses have their tender spore cases splitting into four valves and with their spores are intermixed some slender spiral and very hygrometric threads called elators which are thought to aid in the dispersion of the spores figures five four two to five four four illustration figure five four two fructification of a younger mania magnified its cellular spore stalk surrounded at base by some of the leaves at summit the four valved spore case opening discharging spores and elators five four three two elators and some spores from the same highly magnified illustration figure five four four one of the frondo's liverworts stetia otherwise like a younger mania the spore case not yet protruded from its sheath marcantia the commonest and largest of the true liverworts forms large green plates or fronds on damp and shady ground and sends up from some part of the upper face a stout stalk ending in a several lobed umbrella shaped body under the lobes of which hang several thin walled spore cases which burst open and discharge spores and elators Rickia natans figure five four five consists of wedge-shaped or heart-shaped fronds which float free in pools of still water the under face bears copious rootlets in the substance of the upper face are the spore cases their pointed tips merely projecting there they burst open and discharge their spores these are comparatively few and large and are in fours so they are very like the macrospores of pillworts or quillworts thallophyta or thallophytes in english form this is the name for the lower class of cellular cryptogams plants in which there is no marked distinction into root stem and leaves roots in any proper sense they never have as organs for absorbing although some of the larger seaweeds such as the sea colander figure five five three have them as holdfasts instead of axis and foliage there is a stratum of frond in such plants commonly called a thallus by a strained use of a greek and latin word which means a green shoot or bough which may have any kind of form leaf-like stem-like branchy extended to a flat plate or gathered into a sphere or drawn out into threads or reduced to a single row of cells or even reduced to single cells indeed thallophytes are so multifarious 
so numerous in kinds, so protean in their stages and transformations, so recondite in their fructification, and many so microscopic in size, either of the plant itself or its essential organs, that they have to be elaborately described in separate books and made subjects of special study. Illustration Figures 545-546 Two plants of Rickia natans, about natural size. 547 Magnified section of a part of the frond, showing two immersed spore cases and one emptied space. 548 Magnified section of a spore case with some spores. 549 Magnified spore case torn out and spores. One figure of the spores united, the other of the four separated. Nevertheless, it may be well to try to give some general idea of what algae and lichens and fungi are. Linnaeus had them all under the orders of algae and fungi. Afterwards the lichens were separated, but of late it has been made most probable that a lichen consists of an alga and a fungus conjoined. At least it must be so in some of the ambiguous forms. Botanists are in the way of bringing out new classifications of the thallophytes, as they come to understand their structure and relations better. Here it need only be said that lichens live in the air, that is, on the ground, or on rocks, trunks, walls, and the like, and grow when moistened by rains. They assimilate air, water, and some earthy matter, just as do ordinary plants. Algae, or seaweeds, live in water, and live the same kind of life as do ordinary plants. Fungi, whatever medium they inhabit, live as animals do, upon organic matter, upon what other plants have assimilated, or upon the products of their decay. True as these general distinctions are, it is no less true that these orders run together in their lowest forms, and that algae and fungi may be traced down into forms so low and simple that no clear line can be drawn between them, and even into forms of which it is uncertain whether they should be called plants or animals. It is as well to say that they are not high enough in rank to be distinctively either the one or the other. On the other hand, there is a peculiar group of plants which, in simplicity of composition, resemble the simpler algae, while in fructification, and in the arrangements of their simple cells into stem and branches, they seem to be of a higher order, namely, Illustration, figure 550, branch of a chara, about natural size. 551, a fruiting portion, magnified, showing the structure, a sporocarp and an antheridium. 552, outlines of a portion of the stem in section, showing the central cell and the outer or cortical cells. Characeae, these are aquatic herbs of considerable size, abounding in ponds. The simple kinds, nitella, have the stem formed of a single row of tubular cells, and at the nodes, or junction of the cells, a whirl of similar branches. Chara, figures 550 to 552, is the same, except that the cells which make up the stem and the principal branches are strengthened by a coating of many smaller tubular cells applied to the surface of the main or central cell. The fructification consists of a globular sporocarp of considerable size which is spirally enwrapped by tubular cells twisted around it. By the side of this is a smaller and globular antheridium. The latter breaks up into eight shield-shaped pieces with an internal stalk and bearing long and ribbon-shaped filaments, which consist of a row of delicate cells, each of which discharges a free-moving microscopic thread, the analogue of the pollen or pollen tube, nearly in the manner of ferns and mosses, one of these threads reaches and fertilizes a cell at the apex of the nucleus or solid body of the sporocarp. This subsequently germinates and forms a new individual. Algae or seaweeds. The proper seaweeds may be studied by the aid of Professor Farlow's Marine Algae of New England, the freshwater species by Professor H. C. Wood's Freshwater Algae of North America, a larger and less accessible volume. A few common forms are here very briefly mentioned and illustrated to give an idea of the family, but they are of almost endless diversity. Illustration, figure 553, Agarum turneri, sea colander, so called from the perforations with which the frond, as it grows, becomes riddled. 
very much reduced in size. Illustration, figure 554, upper end of a rockweed, Fucus vesiculosus, reduced half or more. B, the fructification. The common rockweed, Fucus vesiculosus, figure 554, abounding between high and low water mark on the coast. The rarer sea colander, Agarum turneri, figure 553, and laminaria, of which the larger forms are called devil's aprons, are good representatives of the olive green or brownish seaweeds. They are attached either by a disc like base or by root like holdfasts to the rocks or stones on which they grow. Illustration, figure 555, magnified section through a fertile conceptacle of rockweed, showing the large spores in the midst of threads of cells. 556, similar section of a sterile conceptacle, containing slender antheridia, from Farlow's Marine Algae of New England. The hollow and inflated places in the Fucus fasciculosus or rockweed, figure 554, are air bladders for buoyancy. The fructification forms in the substance of the tips of the frond. The rough dots mark the places where the conceptacles open. The spores and the fertilizing cells are in different plants. Sections of the two kinds of conceptacles are given in figures 555 and 556. The contents of the conceptacles are discharged through a small orifice, which in each figure is at the margin of the page. The large spores are formed eight together in a mother cell. The minute motile filaments of the antheridia fertilize the large spores after injection into the water, and then the latter promptly acquire a cell wall and germinate. The Floridii, or rose-red, series of marine algae, which, however, are sometimes green or brownish, are the most attractive to amateurs. The delicate porphyra, or laver, is in some countries eaten as a delicacy, and the cartilaginous chondrus crispus has been largely used for jelly. Besides their conceptacles, which contain true spores, figure 560, they mostly have a fructification in tetraspores, that is, of spores originating in fours. Figure 559. Illustration, figure 557, small plant of chondrus crispus, or carrageen moss, reduced in size, in fruit. The spots represent the fructification, consisting of numerous tetraspores in bunches in the substance of the plant. 558, section through the thickness of one of the lobes, magnified, passing through two of the embedded fruit clusters. 559, two of its tetraspores, spores in fours, highly magnified. Illustration, figure 560, section through a conceptacle of Delesseria lepriurii, much magnified, showing the spores, which are single specialized cells, two or three in a row. Illustration, figure 561, a piece of the rose-red Delesseria lepriurii, double natural size. 562, a piece cut out and much magnified showing that it is composed of a layer of cells. 563. A few of the cells more highly magnified. The cells are gelatinous and thick-walled. The grass-green algae sometimes form broad membranous fronds, such as those of the common ulva of the seashore, but most of them form mere threads, either simple or branched. To this division belong almost all the freshwater algae, such as those which constitute the silky threads or green slime of running streams or standing pools, and which were all called confervas before their immense diversity was known. Some are formed of a single row of cells, developed each from the end of another. Others branch, the top of one cell producing more than one new one. Figure 564. Others, of a kind which is very common in fresh water, Simple threads made of a line of cells have the chlorophyll and protoplasm of each cell arranged in spiral lines or bands. They form spores in a peculiar way which gives to this family the designation of conjugating algae. Illustration figure 564 The growing end of a branching conferva, Clodophora glomerata, much magnified, showing how, by a kind of budding growth, a new cell is formed by a cross partition separating the newer tip from the older part below also how the branches arise illustration figure 565 two magnified individuals of a spirogyra forming spores by conjugation a completed spore at base above successive stages of the conjugation are represented 
at a certain time two parallel threads approach each other more closely contiguous parts of a cell of each thread bulge or grow out and unite when they meet the cell wall partitions between them are absorbed so as to open a free communication the spiral band of green matter in both cells breaks up the whole of that of one cell passes over into the other and of the united contents a large green spore is formed soon the old cells decay and the spore set free is ready to germinate figure 565 represents several stages of the conjugating process which however would never be found altogether like this in one pair of threads illustration figure 566 clostidium acutum a common desmid moderately magnified it is a single firm-celled wall filled with green protoplasmic matter illustration figure 567 more magnified view of three stages of the conjugation of a pair of the same desmids and diatomes which are microscopic one-celled plants of the same class conjugate in the same way as is shown in a clostidium by figures 566 567 here the whole living contents of two individuals are incorporated into one spore for a fresh start a reproduction which costs the life of two individuals to make a single new one would be fatal to the species if there were not a provision for multiplication by the prompt division of the new formed individual into two and these again into two and so on in geometrical ratio and the costly process would be meaningless if there were not some real advantage in such a fresh start that is in sexes illustration figure five six eight early stage of a species of botridium a globose cell five six nine five seventy stages of growth five seven one full-grown plant extended and ramified below in a root-like way five seven two a voucheria single cell grown on into a much branched thread the end of some branches enlarging and the green contents in one a there condensed into a spore five seven three more magnified view of a and the mature spore escaping five seven four bryopsis plumosa apex of a stem with its branchlets all the extension of one cell variously magnified there are other algae of the grass green series which consist of single cells but which by continued growth form plants of considerable size three kinds of these are represented in figures 568 to 574 lichens latin lichenes are to be studied in the works of the late professor tuckerman but a popular exposition is greatly needed the subjoined illustrations figures 575 to 580 may simply indicate what some of the commoner forms are like the cup or shield-shaped spot or knob which bears the fructification is named the apothecium this is mainly composed of slender sacs asci having thread-shaped cells intermixed and each ascus contains few or several spores which are commonly double or treble most lichens are flat expansions of greyish hue some of them foliaceous in texture but never of bright green colour more are crustaceous some are wholly pulverulent and nearly formless but in several the vegetation lengthens into an axis as in figure five eight o or imitates stem and branches or threads as in the reindeer moss on the ground in our northern woods and the usnea hanging from the boughs of old trees overhead illustration figure five seven five a stone on which various lichens are growing such as passing from left to right a parmelia a sticta and on the right lecidia geographica so called from its patches resembling the outline of islands or continents as depicted upon maps five seven six piece of thallus of parmelia conspersa with section through an apothecium five seven seven section of a smaller apothecium enlarged five seven eight two asci of same and contained spores and accompanying filaments more magnified five seven nine piece of thallus of a sticta with section showing the immersed apothecia the small openings of these dot the surface five eight o oh, cladonia coccinea the fructification is in the scarlet knobs which surround the cups 
fungi for this immense and greatly diversified class it must here suffice to indicate the parts of a mushroom a sphaeria and of one or two common moulds the true vegetation of common fungi consists of slender cells which form what is called a mycelium these filamentous cells lengthen and branch growing by the absorption through their whole surface of the decaying or organizable or living matter which they feed upon in a mushroom agaricus a knobby mass is at length formed which develops into a stout stalk stipe bearing the cap pileus the underside of the cap is covered by the hymenium in this genus consisting of radiating plates the gills or lamellae and these bear the powdery spores in immense numbers under the microscope the gills are found to be studded with projecting cells each of which at the top produces four stalked spores these form the powder which collects on a sheet of paper upon which a mature mushroom is allowed to rest for a day or two figures five eight one to five eight six the esculent morel also sphaeria figures five eight five five eight six and many other fungi bear their spores in sacs ascii exactly in the manner of lichens illustration figure five eight one agaricus campestris the common edible mushroom five eight two section of cap and stalk five eight three minute portion of a section of a gill showing some spore bearing cells much magnified five eight four one of these with its four spores more magnified illustration figure five eight five sphaeria rosella five eight six two of the ascii and contained double spores quite like those of a lichen much magnified of the moulds one of the commoner is the bread mould figure five eight seven in fruiting it sends up a slender stalk which bears a globular sac this bursts at maturity and discharges innumerable spores the blue cheese mould figure five eight eight bears a cluster of branches at top each of which is a row of naked spores like a string of beads all breaking apart at maturity botrytis figure five eight nine the fruiting stalk of which branches and each branch is tipped with a spore is one of the many moulds which live and feed upon the juices of other plants and are often very destructive the extremely numerous kinds of smut rust mildew the ferments bacteria and the like many of them very destructive to other vegetable and to animal life are also low forms of the class of fungi illustration figure five eight seven ascophora the bread mould five eight eight aspergillus glaucus the mould of cheese but common on mouldy vegetables five eight nine a species of botrytis all magnified end of section twenty section twenty one of the elements of botany this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the elements of botany by asa gray section eighteen classification and nomenclature classification in botany is the consideration of plants in respect to their kinds and relationships some system of nomenclature or naming is necessary for fixing and expressing botanical knowledge so as to make it available the vast multiplicity of plants and the various degrees of their relationship imperatively require order and system not only as to names for designating the kinds of plants but also as to terms for defining their differences nomenclature is concerned with the names of plants terminology supplies names of organs or parts and terms to designate their differences one kinds and relationship plants and animals have two great peculiarities first they form themselves and second they multiply themselves they reproduce their kind in a continued succession of individuals mineral things occur as masses which are divisible into smaller and still smaller ones without alteration of properties but organic things vegetables and animals exist as individual beings each owes its existence to a parent and produces similar individuals in its turn 
so each individual is a link of a chain and to this chain the natural historian applies the name of species all the descendants from the same stock therefore compose one species and it was from our observing that the several sorts of plants or animals steadily reproduce themselves or in other words keep up a succession of similar individuals that the idea of species originated there are few species however in which man has actually observed the succession for many generations it could seldom be proved that all the white pine trees or white oaks of any forest came from the same stock but observation having familiarized us with the general fact that individuals proceeding from the same stock are essentially alike we infer from their close resemblance that these similar individuals belong to the same species that is we infer it when the individuals are as much like each other as those are which we know or confidently suppose to have sprung from the same stock identity in species is inferred from close similarity in all essential respects or whenever the differences however considerable are not known or reasonably supposed to have been originated in the course of time under changed conditions no two individuals are exactly alike a tendency to variation pervades all living things in cultivation where variations are looked after and cared for very striking differences come to light and if in wild nature they are less common or less conspicuous it is partly because they are uncared for when such variant forms are pretty well marked they are called varieties the white oak for example presents two or three varieties in the shape of the leaves although they may be all alike upon each particular tree the question often arises and it is often hard to answer whether the difference in a particular case is that of a variety or is specific if the former it may commonly be proved by finding such intermediate degrees of difference in various individuals as to show that no clear distinction can be drawn between them or else by observing the variety to vary back again in some of its offspring the sorts of apples pears potatoes and the like show that differences which are permanent in the individual and continue unchanged through a long series of generations when propagated by division as by offsets cuttings grafts bulbs tubers etc are not likely to be reproduced by seed still they sometimes are so and perhaps always tend in that direction for the fundamental law in organic nature is that offspring shall be like parent races are such strongly marked varieties capable of coming true to seed the different sorts of wheat maize peas radishes etc are familiar examples by selecting those individuals of a species which have developed or inherited any desirable peculiarity keeping them from mingling with their less promising brethren and selecting again the most promising plants raised from their seeds the cultivator may in a few generations render almost any variety transmissible by seed so long as it is cared for and kept apart in fact this is the way the cultivated domestic races so useful to man have been fixed and preserved races in fact can hardly if at all be said to exist independently of man but man does not really produce them such peculiarities often surprising enough now and then originate we know not how the plant sports as the gardeners say they are only preserved propagated and generally further developed by the cultivator's skilful care if left alone they are likely to dwindle and perish or else revert to the original form of the species vegetable races are commonly annuals which can be kept up only by seed or herbs of which a succession of generations can be had every year or two and so the education by selection be completed without great lapse of time but all fruit trees could probably be fixed into races in an equal number of generations bud varieties are those which spring from buds instead of seed they are uncommon to any marked extent they are sometimes called sports but this name is equally applied to variations among seedlings crossbreeds strictly so called are the variations which come from cross fertilizing one variety of a species with another hybrids are the varieties 
if they may be so called, which come from crossing of species. Only nearly related species can be hybridized, and the resulting progeny is usually self-sterile, but not always. Hybrid plants, however, may often be fertilized and made prolific by the pollen of one or the other parent. This produces another kind of cross-breeds. Species are the units in classification. Varieties, although of utmost importance in cultivation and of considerable consequence in the flora of any country, are of less botanical significance. For they are apt to be indefinite and to shade off one form into another. But species, the botanist expects to be distinct. Indeed, the practical difference to the botanist between species and varieties is the definite limitation of the one and the indefiniteness of the other. The botanist's determination is partly a matter of observation, partly of judgment. In an enlarged view, varieties may be incipient species, and nearly related species probably come from a common stock in earlier times for there is every reason to believe that existing vegetation came from the more or less changed vegetation of a preceding geological era. However that may be, species are regarded as permanent and essentially unchanged in their succession of individuals through the actual ages. There are, at nearly the lowest computation, as many as 100,000 species of phanerogamous plants and the cryptogamous species are thought to be still more numerous. They are all connected by resemblances or relationships, near and remote, which show that they are all parts of one system, realizations in nature, as we may affirm, of the conception of one mind. As we survey them, they do not form a single and connected chain, stretching from the lowest to the highest organized species, although there obviously are lower and higher grades, but the species throughout group themselves, as it were, into clusters or constellations, and these into still more comprehensive clusters, and so on, with gaps between. It is this clustering which is the ground of the recognition of kinds of species, that is, of groups of species, of successive grades, or degree of generality, such as that of similar species into genera, of genera into families or orders, of orders into classes. In classification the sequence, proceeding from higher or more general to lower or special, is always class, order, genus, species, variety if need be. Genera, in the singular genus, are assemblages of closely related species in which the essential parts are all constructed on the same particular type or plan. White oak, red oak, scarlet oak, live oak, etc., are so many species of the oak genus, Latin quercus. The chestnuts compose another genus, the beeches another. The apple, pear, and crab are species of one genus, the quince represents another, the various species of hawthorn a third. In the animal kingdom, the common cat, the wild cat, the panther, the tiger, the leopard, and the lion are species of the cat kind or genus while the dog, the jackal, the different species of wolf, and the foxes compose another genus. Some genera are represented by a vast number of species, others by few, very many by only one known species, for the genus may be as perfectly represented in one species as in several, although, if this were the case throughout, genera and species would of course be identical. The beech genus and the chestnut genus would be just as distinct from the oak genus, even if but one beech and chestnut were known, as indeed was once the case. Orders are groups of genera which resemble each other, that is, they are to genera what genera are to species. As familiar illustrations, the oak, chestnut, and beech genera, along with the hazel genus and the hornbeams, all belong to one order. The birches and the alders make another, the poplars and willows another, the walnuts with the butternut and the hickories still another, the apple genus, the quince and the hawthorns, along with the plums and cherries and the peach, the raspberry with the blackberry, the strawberry, the rose, belong to a large order which takes its name from the rose. Most botanists use the names order and family synonymously. 
the latter more popularly, as the rose family, the former more technically, as order rosaceae. But when the two are distinguished, as is common in zoology, family is of lower grade than order. Classes are still more comprehensive assemblages, or great groups. Thus in modern botany, the dicotyledonous plants compose one class, the monocotyledonous plants another. These four grades, class, order, genus, species, are of universal use. Variety comes in upon occasion. For although a species may have no recognized varieties, a genus implies at least one species belonging to it. Every genus is of some order, and every order of some class. But these grades by no means exhaust the resources of classification nor suffice for the elucidation of all the distinctions which botanists recognize. In the first place, a higher grade than that of class is needful for the most comprehensive of divisions, that of all plants into the two series of phanerogamous and cryptogamous. And in natural history there are the two kingdoms or realms, the vegetable and the animal. Moreover, the stages of the scaffolding have been variously extended, as required, by the recognition of assemblages, lower than class but higher than order, viz. subclass and cohort, or lower than order, a suborder, or between this and genus, a tribe, or between this and tribe, a subtribe, or between genus and species, a subgenus, and by some a species has been divided into subspecies and a variety into subvarieties. Last of all are individuals. Suffice it to remember that the following are the principal grades in classification, with the proper sequence. Also that only those here printed in small capitals are fundamental and universal in botany. Series. Class, subclass, cohort. Order or family. Suborder, tribe, subtribe genus, subgenus, or section, species, variety. 2. Names, terms, and characters. The name of a plant is the name of its genus followed by that of the species. The name of the genus answers to the surname or family name, that of the species to the baptismal name of a person. Thus Quercus is the name of the oak genus, Quercus alba, that of the white oak, Quercus rubra, that of the red oak, Quercus nigra, that of the blackjack, etc. Botanical names being Latin or Latinized, the adjective name of the species comes after that of the genus. Names of genera are of one word, a substantive. The older ones are mostly classical Latin or Greek adopted into Latin, such as Quercus for the oak genus, Vagus for the beech, Corylus the hazel, and the like. But as more genera become known, botanists had new names to make or borrow. Many are named from some appearance or property of the flowers, leaves, or other parts of the plant. To take a few examples from the early pages of the Manual of the Botany of the Northern United States, the genus Hepatica comes from the shape of the leaf resembling that of the liver. Myosurus means mousetail. Delphinium is from delphin, a dolphin, and alludes to the shape of the flower, which was thought to resemble the classical figures of the dolphin. Xanthoriza is from two Greek words meaning yellow root, the common name of the plant. Simisifuga is formed of two Latin words meaning to drive away bugs, i.e. bugbane, the Siberian species being used to keep away such vermin. Sanguinaria, the blood root, is named from the blood-like color of its juice. Other genera are dedicated to distinguished botanists or promoters of science and bear their names, such as Magnolia, which commemorates the early French botanist Magnol, and Jeffersonia, named after President Jefferson, who sent the first exploring expedition over the Rocky Mountains. Others bear the name of the discoverer of the plant, as Saracenia, dedicated to Dr. Sarazin of Quebec who was one of the first to send the common pitcher plant to the botanists of Europe, and Claytonia, first made known by the early Virginian botanist Clayton. Names of Species The name of a species is also a single word appended to that of the genus. It is commonly an adjective, and therefore agrees with the generic name in case, gender, etc. 
sometimes it relates to the country the species inhabits as claytonia virginica first made known from virginia sanguinaria canadensis from canada etc more commonly it denotes some obvious or characteristic trait of the species as for example in saracenia our northern species is named purpurea from the purple blossoms while a more southern one is named flava because its petals are yellow the species of jeffersonia is called defila meaning two-leaved because its leaf is divided into two leaflets some species are named after the discoverer or in compliment to a botanist who has made them known as magnolia fraseri named after the botanist fraser one of the first to find this species and saracenia drummondi for a pitcher plant found by mr drummond in florida such personal specific names are of course written with a capital initial letter occasionally some old substantive name is used for the species as magnolia umbrella the umbrella tree and ranunculus flammula these are also written with a capital initial and need not accord with the generic name in gender geographical specific names such as canadensis caroliniana americana in the latter usage are by some written without a capital initial but the older usage is better or at least more accordant with english orthography varietal names when any are required are made on the plan of specific names and follow these with the prefix var ranunculus flammula variety reptans the creeping variety ranunculus abertivus variety micranthus the small flowered variety of the species in recording the name of a plant it is usual to append the name or an abbreviation of the name of the botanist who first published it and in a flora or other systematic work this reference to the source of the name is completed by a further citation of the name of the book the volume and page where it was first published so ranunculus acris l means that this buttercup was first so named and described by linnaeus ranunculus multifidus persh that this species was so named and published by persh the suffix is no part of the name but is an abbreviated reference to be added or omitted as convenience or definiteness may require the authority for a generic name is similarly recorded thus ranunculus l means that the genus was so named by linnaeus myosurus dill means that the mouse tail was established as a genus under this name by delenius colophyllum m i c h x that the blue cohosh was published under this name by Micho. the full reverence in the last named instance would be in flora borelli americana first volume two hundred and fifth page in the customary abbreviation m i c h x f l i two o five names of orders are given in the plural number and are commonly formed by prolonging the name of a genus of the group taken as a representative of it for example the order of which the buttercup or crowfoot genus ranunculus is the representative takes from it the name of ranunculaceae meaning plantae ranunculaceae when written out in full that is ranunculaceous plants some old descriptive names of orders are kept up such as cruciferi for the order to which cress and mustard belong from the cruciform appearance of their expanded corolla and umbelliferi from the flowers being in umbels names of tribes also of suborders subtribes and the like are plurals of the names of the typical genus less prolonged usually in ei in i i die etc thus the proper buttercup tribe is ranunculiae of the clematis tribe clematididae while the rose family is rosaceae the special rose tribe is rosiae names of classes etc for these see the following synopsis of the actual classification adopted so a plant is named in two words the generic and the specific names to which may be added a third that of the variety upon occasion the generic name is peculiar obviously it must not be used twice over in botany the specific name must not be used twice over in the same genus but is free for any other genus 
a quercus alba or white oak is no hindrance to betula alba or white birch and so of other names characters and descriptions plants are characterized by a terse statement in botanical terms of their peculiarities or distinguishing marks the character of the order should include nothing which is common to the whole class it belongs to that of the genus nothing which is common to the order that of the species nothing that is shared with all other species of the genus and so of other divisions descriptions may enter into complete details of the whole structure terminology also called glossology is nomenclature applied to organs or parts in their forms or modifications each organ or special part has a substantive name of its own shapes and other modifications of an organ or part are designated by adjective terms or when the forms are peculiar substantive terms are given to them by the correct use of such botanical terms and by proper subordination of the characters under the order genus species etc plants may be described and determined with much precision the classical language of botany is latin while modern languages have their own names and terms these usually lack the precision of the latin or latinized botanical terminology fortunately this latinized terminology has been largely adopted and incorporated into the english technical language of botany thus securing precision and these terms are largely the basis of specific names of plants a glossary or vocabulary of the principal botanical terms used in phanerogamous and vascular cryptogamous botany is appended to this volume to which the student may refer as occasion arises three system two systems of classification used to be recognized in botany the artificial and the natural but only the latter is now thought to deserve the name of a system artificial classifications have for object merely the ascertaining of the name and place of a plant they do not attempt to express relationships but serve as a kind of dictionary they distribute the genera and species according to some one peculiarity or set of peculiarities just as a dictionary distributes words according to their first letters disregarding all other considerations at present an artificial classification in botany is needed only as a key to the natural orders as an aid in referring an unknown plant to its proper family and such keys are still very needful at least for the beginner formerly when the orders themselves were not clearly made out an artificial classification was required to lead the student down to the genus two such classifications were long in vogue first that of tournefort founded mainly on the leaves of the flowers the calyx and corolla this was the prevalent system throughout the first half of the eighteenth century but it has long since gone by it was succeeded by the well-known artificial system of Linnaeus, which was founded on the stamens and pistils. It consists of twenty-four classes, and of a variable number of orders. The classes founded mainly on the number and disposition of the stamens, the orders partly upon the number of styles or stigmas, partly upon other considerations. Useful and popular as this system was down to a time within the memory of still surviving botanists, it is now completely obsolete but the tradition of it survives in the names of its classes monandria diandria triandria etc which are familiar in terminology in the adjective terms monandrous diandrous triandrous etc also of the orders monogyna digyna trigyna etc preserved in the form of monogynous digynous trigynous etc and in the name cryptogamia that of the twenty-fourth class which is continued for the lower series in the natural classification natural system a genuine system of botany consists of the orders or families duly arranged under their classes and having the tribes the genera and the species arranged in them according to their relationships this when properly carried out is the natural system because it is intended to express as well as possible the various degrees of relationship among plants as presented in nature that is to rank those species and those genera etc 
next to each other in the classification which are really most alike in all respects or in other words which are constructed most nearly on the same particular plan there can be only one natural system of botany if by this term is meant the plan according to which the vegetable creation was called into being with all its grades and diversities among the species as well of past as of the present time but there may be many natural systems if we mean the attempts of men to interpret and express that plan systems which will vary with advancing knowledge and with the judgment and skill of different botanists these must all be very imperfect bear the impress of individual minds and be shaped by the current philosophy of the age but the endeavour always is to make the classification answer to nature as far as any system can which has to be expressed in a definite and serial arrangement so although the classes orders genera etc are natural or as natural as the systematist can make them their grouping or order of arrangement in a book must necessarily be in great measure artificial indeed it is quite impossible to arrange the orders or even the few classes in a single series and yet have each group stand next to its nearest relatives on both sides especially it should be understood that although phanerogamous plants are of higher grade than cryptogamous and angiospermous or ordinary phanerogamous higher than the gymnospermous yet there is no culmination in the vegetable kingdom nor any highest or lowest order of phanerogamous plants the particular system most largely used at present in the classification of the orders is essentially the following series one phanerogamia phanerogamous or flowering plants class one dicotyledones angiospermiae called for shortness in english dicotyledons or dicotyls ovules in a closed ovary embryo dicotyledonous stem with exogenous plan of growth leaves reticulate veined artificial division one polypetali with petals mostly present and distinct orders about eighty in number ranunculaceae to cornaceae artificial division two gamopetali with gamopetalous corolla order is about forty five caprifoliaceae to plantagenaceae artificial division three apetali or incompletae with perianth when present of calyx only orders about thirty five in number from nictagenaceae to salicaceae class two dicotyledones gymnospermiae in english gymnosperms no ovary or pericarp but ovules and seeds naked and no proper calyx nor corolla embryo dicotyledonous or polycotyledonous stem with exogenous plan of growth leaves mostly parallel veined consists of order nitaceae which strictly connects with angiospermous dicotyls or coniferae and of cycadaceae class three monocotyledones in english monocotyledons or monocotyls angiospermous embryo monocotyledonous stem with endogenous plan of growth leaves mostly parallel veined division one petaloidae perianth complete having the equivalent of both calyx and corolla and all the inner series coralline about eighteen orders division two calycinae perianth complete in two series but not coralline mostly thickish or glumaceous chiefly two orders juncaceae the true rushes and palmi palms division three spadicaflori or nudiflori perianth none or rudimentary and incomplete inflorescence spadaceous of five orders typhaceae and aroidae the principal division four glumaceae perianth none or very rudimentary glumaceous bracts to the flowers order is mainly cyperaceae and graminiae series two cryptogamia cryptogamous or flowerless plants class one pteridophyta pteridophytes class two bryophyta 
bryophytes class three thallophyta thallophytes end of section twenty one section twenty two of the elements of botany this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by corinne lepage the elements of botany by asa gray section nineteen botanical work some hints and brief instructions for the collection examination and preservation of specimens are added they are especially intended for the assistance of those who have not the advantage of a teacher they apply to phanerogamous plants and ferns only and to systemic botany one collection or herborization as much as possible plants should be examined in the living state or when freshly gathered but dried specimens should be prepared for more leisurely examination and for comparison to the working botanist good dried specimens are indispensable botanical specimens to be complete should have root or rootstock stem leaves flowers both open and in bud and fruit sometimes these may be all obtained at one gathering more commonly two or three gatherings at different times are requisite especially for trees and shrubs in herborizing a good knife and a narrow and strong trowel are needed but a very strong knife will serve instead of a trowel or small pick for digging out bulbs tubers and the like to carry the specimens either the tin box vasculum or portfolio or both are required the tin box is best for the collection of specimens to be used fresh as in the classroom also for very thick or fleshy plants the portfolio is indispensable for long expeditions and is best for specimens which are to be preserved in the herbarium the vasculum or botanical collecting box is made of tin in shape like a candle box only flatter or the smaller sizes like an english sandwich case the lid opening for nearly the whole length of one side of the box any portable tin box of convenient size and capable of holding specimens a foot or fifteen inches long will answer the purpose the box should shut close so that the specimens may not wilt then it will keep leafy branches and most flowers perfectly fresh for a day or two especially if slightly moistened they should not be wet the portfolio is best made of two pieces of solid binders board covered with enamel cloth which also forms the back and fastened by straps and buckles it may be from a foot to twenty inches long from nine to eleven or twelve inches wide it should contain a needful quantity of smooth but strong and pliable paper thin so-called manila paper is best either fastened at the back as in a book or loose in folded sheets when not very many specimens are required as soon as gathered the specimens should be separately laid between the leaves or in the folded sheets and kept under moderate pressure in the closed portfolio of small herbs especially annuals the whole plant root and all should be taken for a specimen of larger ones branches will suffice with some leaves from near the root enough of the root or subterranean part of the plant should be collected to show whether it is an annual or biennial or perennial thick roots bulbs tubers or branches of specimens intended to be pressed should be thinned with a knife or cut into slices keep the specimens within the length of fifteen or sixteen inches by folding or when that cannot be done by cutting into lengths for drying specimens a good supply of soft and unsized paper is wanted and some convenient means of applying considerable pressure to make good dried botanical specimens dry them as rapidly as possible between many thicknesses of sun-dried paper to absorb their moisture under as much pressure as can be given without crushing the more delicate parts this pressure may be had by a botanical press of which various forms have been contrived or by weights placed upon a board from forty to eighty or a hundred pounds according to the quantity of specimens drying at the time for use while travelling a good portable press may be made of thick binders boards for the sides and the pressure may be applied by strong straps with buckles still better on some accounts are portable presses made of wire network 
which allow the dampness to escape by evaporation between the meshes. For herborization in a small way, a light wire press may be taken into the field and made to serve also as a portfolio. It is well to have two kinds of paper, namely dryers of bibulous paper, stitched into pads, or the pads may be of thick carpet paper cut to size, and thin smooth paper folded once, the specimens to be laid into the fold, either when gathered or on returning from the excursion. These sheets are to hold the specimens until they are quite dry. Every day, or at least first even twice a day, the specimens, left undisturbed in their sheets, are to be shifted into fire-dried or sun-dried fresh dryers, and the pressure renewed, while the moist sheets are spread out to dry, so as to take their turn again at the next shifting. This course must be continued until the specimens are no longer moist to the touch. Good and comely specimens are either made or spoiled within the first twenty-four or thirty-six hours. After that, when plenty of dryers are used, it may not be necessary to change them so frequently. Succulent plants, which long refuse to part with life in moisture, the spruces and some other evergreens which are apt to cast off their leaves, may be plunged for a moment into boiling water, all but the flowers. Delicate flowers may be encased in thin tissue paper when put into the press. Thick parts, like the heads of sunflowers and thistles, may be cut in two or into slices. Dried specimens may be packed in bundles, either in folded paper or upon single half-sheets. It is better that such paper should not be bibulous. The packages should be well wrapped or kept in close cases. Poisoning is necessary if specimens are to be permanently preserved from the depredation of insects. The usual application is an almost saturated solution of corrosive sublimate in 95% alcohol, freely applied with a large and soft brush, or the specimens dipped into some of the solution, poured into a large and flat dish, the wetted specimens to be transferred for a short time to dryers. Herbarium The botanist's collection of dried specimens, ticketed with their names, place, and time of collection, and systematically arranged under the genera, orders, etc., forms a horta siccus, or herbarium. It comprises not only the specimens which the proprietor has himself collected, but those which he acquires through friendly exchanges, or in other ways. The specimens of an herbarium may be kept in folded sheets of paper, or they may be fastened on half-sheets of thick and white paper, either by gummed slips or by glue applied to the specimens themselves. The former is best for private and small herbaria, the latter for large ones which are much turned over. Each sheet should be appropriated to one species. Two or more different plants should never be attached to the same sheet. The generic and specific name of the plant should be added to the lower right-hand corner, either written on the sheet or on a ticket pasted down, and the time of collection, the locality, the color of the flowers, and any other information which the specimens themselves do not afford should be duly recorded upon the sheet or on the ticket. The sheets of the herbarium should all be of exactly the same dimensions. The herbarium of Linnaeus is on paper of the common foolscap size, about eleven inches long and seven wide. This is too small. Sixteen and three-eighths inches by eleven and a half inches is an approved size. The sheets containing the species of each genus are to be placed in genus covers, made of a full sheet of thick paper such as the strongest manila hemp paper, to be when folded of the same dimensions as the species sheet but slightly wider. The name of the genus is to be written on one of the lower corners, these are to be arranged under the orders to which they belong, and the whole kept in closed cases or cabinets, either laid flat in compartments, like pigeonholes, or else placed in thick portfolios arranged in folio volumes. All should be kept, as much as practicable, in dust-proof and insect-proof cases or boxes. Fruits, tubers, and other hard parts too thick for the herbarium may be kept in pasteboard or light wooden boxes, in a collection apart. Small, loose fruits, seeds, detached flowers, and the like may be conveniently preserved in paper capsules or envelopes attached to the herbarium sheets. Investigation and Determination of Plants The implements required are a hand magnifying glass, a pocket lens of an inch or two focus, or a glass of two lenses, one of the lower and the other of the higher power, 
and a sharp penknife for dissection. With these and reasonable perseverance, the structure of the flowers and fructification of most phanerogamous plants and ferns can be made out. But for ease and comfort, as well as for certainty and right training, the student should have some kind of simple stage microscope, and under this make all the dissections of small parts. Without it, the student will be apt to fall into the bad habit of guessing where he ought to ascertain. The simple microscope may be reduced to a good lens or doublet of an inch focus, mounted over a glass stage, so that it can be moved up and down and also sideways, and with or without a little mirror underneath. A better one would have one or two additional lenses, say of half or of a quarter inch focus, a pretty large stage on the glass of which several small objects can be placed and conveniently brought under the lens, and its height or that of the lens should be adjustable by a rack work, also a swivel mounted little mirror beneath which is needed for minute objects to be viewed by transmitted light. For dissecting and displaying small parts on the stage of the microscope, besides a thin bladed knife, the only tools needed are a good stock of common needles of various sizes mounted in handles or one or more saddler's needles which being triangular may be ground to sharp edges convenient for dissection also a pair of delicate pointed forceps those with curved points used by the dentist are most convenient a cup of clean water is indispensable with which to moisten or wet or in which occasionally to float delicate parts small flowers buds fruits and seeds of dried specimens can be dissected quite as well as fresh ones. They have only to be soaked in warm or boiling water. The compound microscope is rarely necessary except in cryptogamic botany and vegetable anatomy, but it is very useful and convenient, especially for the examination of pollen. To the advanced botanist, it is a necessity. To all students of botany, an aid and delight. Analysis a few directions and hints may be given. The most important is this. In studying an unknown plant, make a complete examination of all its parts and form a clear idea of its floral structure and that of its fruit, from pericarp down to the embryo, or as far as the materials in hand allow, before taking a step toward finding out its name and relationship by means of the keys or other helps which the manuals and floras provide. If it is the name merely that is wanted, the shorter way is to ask someone who already knows it, to verify the points of structure one by one as they happen to occur in an artificial key without any preparatory investigation, is a usual but is not the best nor the surest way. It is well to make drawings or outline sketches of the smaller parts, and especially diagrams of the plan of the flower. For these, cross-sections of the flower bud or flower are to be made and longitudinal sections are equally important. The dissection even of small seeds is not difficult after some practice. Commonly, they need to be soaked or boiled. The right appreciation of characters and terms used in description needs practice and calls for judgment. Plants do not grow exactly by rule and plummet, and measurements must be taken loosely. Difference of soil and situation are responded to by considerable variations and other divergences occur which cannot be accounted for by the surroundings, nor be anticipated in general descriptions. Annuals may be very depauperate in dry soils or seasons, or very large when particularly well nourished. Warm and arid situations promote, and wet ones are apt to diminish, pubescence. Salt water causes increased succulence. The color of flowers is apt to be lighter in shade and brighter in open and elevated situations. A color or hue not normal to the species now and then occurs, which nothing in the conditions will account for. A white-flowered variation of any other colored blossom may always be expected. This, though it may be notable, no more indicates a distinct variety of the species than an albino would a variety of the human species. The numerical plan is subject to variation in some flowers. Those on the plan of five may now and then vary to four or six. Variations of the outline or lobing of leaves are so familiar that they do not much mislead. Only wider and longer observation suffices to prevent or correct mistakes in botanical study. 
but the weighing of evidence and the balancing of probabilities no less than the use of the well-ordered and logical system of classification give as excellent training to the judgment as the search for the facts themselves does to the observing powers signs and abbreviations for a full account of these whether former or actual use see structural botany of the botanical textbook as also for the principles which govern the accentuation of names it is needful here to explain only those used in the manuals and floras of this country for which the present volume is an introduction and companion they are not numerous in arranging the species at least those of a larger genus the divisions are denoted and graduated as follows the sign s is prefixed to sections of the highest rank these sections when they have names affixed to them as prunus s serasus may be called subgenera when the divisions of a genus are not of such importance or when divisions are made under the subgenus itself the most comprehensive ones are marked by asterisks one asterisk for the first two asterisks for the second and so on subdivisions are marked with a prefixed plus sign those under this head with two plus signs and those under this with an equal sign if there be so many grades a similar notation is followed in the synopsis of the genera of an order the interrogation point is used in botany to indicate doubt thus clematis crispa l question mark expresses a doubt whether the plant in question is really the clematis crispa of linnaeus clematis question mark polypetala expresses a doubt whether the plant so named is really a clematis on the other hand the exclamation point is used to denote certainty whenever there is a special need to affirm this for size or height the common signs of degrees minutes and seconds have been used thus one degree two minutes three seconds stand respectively for a foot two inches and three lines or twelfths of an inch a better way when such brevity is needed is to write one foot two inches three lines signs for duration used by linnaeus were sun for an annual male for biennial four for a perennial herb symbol like numeral five without top bar for a shrub or tree de candole brought in sun for a plant that died after once flowering one in a circle if annual two in a circle if biennial to indicate sexes the male sign means staminate or male plant blossom female sign pistillate or female symbol like female with two inverted breves perfect or hermaphrodite to save room it is not uncommon to use infinity in place of many thus stamens infinity for stamens indefinitely numerous infinity flora for pluriflora or many flowered still more common is the stamens five twenty or calyx four five parted for stamens from five to twenty calyx four parted or five parted and the like such abbreviations hardly needed explanation the same may be said of such abbreviations as cal for calyx cor for corolla pet for petals st for stamens pist for pistil hab for habitat meaning the place of growth herb for herbarium ort for garden also lc loco citato which avoids repetition of volume and page structural botany has six pages of abbreviations of the names of botanists mostly of botanical authors as they are not much of consequence to the beginner while the more advanced botanists will know the names in full or where to find them only a selection here is appended end of section twenty two recording by corinne lepage end of the elements of botany by asa gray